Hey guys, Brian Schultz here with Cape Falcon Kayak, and I'm here in the shop today with the latest version of my Skin On Frame River Touring Kayak. Now, if you haven't checked out the last video where I talk all about the history and the overall concept of this design project, make sure you check that out, because otherwise a lot of the stuff I'm saying here isn't gonna make that much sense. So, real quick though, just to review, Basically the idea behind this boat is I wanted a boat that I could take on long self-support trips on wilderness trips where I'm gonna be loaded with camping gear for a week or more where there's gonna be a lot of flat water and a lot of swift water, but the occasional pretty serious rapid that I have to get through where a river kayak really isn't the right tool for the job because it's just way too slow and it doesn't have enough volume and a sea kayak doesn't work very well either because it doesn't handle the rapids very well and it's constantly being pulled around in the swift water. And so I started working on this design about 10 years ago, inspired by some of my very first whitewater kayaks from the early 1990s and also the slalom kayaks and the whitewater kayaks of the 1970s and 1980s. And I've come really close to getting this design right quite a few times, but I could just never get it exactly what I wanted. And then a couple years ago, I got a commission for some North Alaskan kayaks, which is a very unique hull shape that doesn't have stems like most Arctic kayaks. The ends just come together really bluntly. And I wasn't able to take those out very much because they were architectural commissions, but I did get to wrap them in saran wrap and take them out on the water. And I knew as soon as I tried that hull shape that I was gonna be able to potentially incorporate it with some of my own modern design ideas and potentially get some fresh input on this particular boat. So the last prototype for this boat was the very first one that I think really felt magical to me. And so whenever we get to that point, we've built a whole bunch of boats, we finally land on one that seems to have a lot of promise, feels really good on the water. The next thing I do is try to increase all the things that I like about it and decrease the things that I don't like and maybe add some additional performance features. And this can really go one way or the other. Sometimes I'll get a good concept and it just keeps getting better and better, but more often than that, oftentimes I'll end up taking steps sideways or steps backwards. And on this new prototype here, I did a little bit of both. And so just kind of a spoiler alert here, this is not the finished version of this kayak. I was really hoping that this boat was gonna be the one, but while I was doing some of my shaping changes here, I made some mistakes, but I think it's always really interesting to talk about that here on the channel because I think both myself and everybody else learns as much from our mistakes as we do from our successes. And really, this is how you move forward, at least if you're being honest, as a designer. And so starting out with the things that I got right about this particular boat, the last boat I absolutely loved. I mean, for something that is as maneuverable as a whitewater kayak, it was incredibly swift. It was also very quiet on the water. It was just a beautiful feeling little boat. Feels nothing like a sea kayak, but it was very, very enjoyable to paddle. Now, what I wanted to change about that boat is I just wanted to bring the overall volume of it up a little bit, because even though I enjoyed paddling it empty, this is a boat that needs to be able to handle some serious whitewater rapids, and anytime you're getting buried in bouncy water, a little bit of extra volume to get you up on top of the water does wonders to increase your handling. And so for this boat, I made it a quarter of an inch deeper and a half of an inch wider, and that brought the overall volume up a little bit, which I think is close to the sweet spot on this, but I also made it a little bit longer as well, and I made it longer in the bow. Now, making it longer in the bow is the last thing I ever want to do with this particular type of a hull concept, because the longer you are in the bow, the more that, that bow can pull you around while you're paddling. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The reason that I decided to go a little bit longer on this boat, though, has nothing to do with functionality of how it paddles on the water. It's just because I need the gear bags that I put into the ends of these boats to be able to slide far enough forward to clear the heels and the toes of a person with a little bit longer inseam than mine. Now, additionally, I also want to be able to put a fully assembled Greenland paddle on the front deck because I've never been a fan of carrying a two-piece break apart paddle because when are you going to need a spare paddle? You're gonna need it when you're upside down and you lost your paddle and you're getting pounded. And at that point, it just doesn't seem super realistic to me to be able to take two pieces off the deck, put them together, and then figure out how to do your roll. So much more effective if you could just grab a fully assembled Greenland paddle off the front deck and roll up with it. So those two things are why I made this boat two and a half inches longer in the bow. Now, 
Additionally, I made some shaping changes to the hull as well. And this is where I really started going sideways with this whole thing, because I think that if I just would have made these changes, but I would have kept the hull basically the same as the last boat, this boat might be the one and we'd be able to release a plan set for it right now. But last boat, while I was paddling it, I noticed that like every whitewater kayak with a rounded hull, I couldn't really work from my edges like you can in a sea kayak. And one of the nice things about a well-designed sea kayak is that while you're going straight, you can drop an edge and you can carve a nice little turn. And that is a great way to be able to maneuver, especially if you're in really tight spaces. Like if you're in a sea cave or you're running a narrow slot between rocks, you don't wanna to have to take a giant corrective stroke because you don't have the room to take that corrective stroke. And so being able to work your edges a little bit like that to maneuver the boat is really useful. And I wondered if I could take that same kind of hard shine that I put into my sea kayaks and add it in the middle section in the back here and get a little bit of that same performance. The answer to that is no, it doesn't work that way. This particular type of a hull shape is never going to be able to maneuver the same way as a sea kayak. In some ways, it's a lot more maneuverable. I mean, you can literally spin it 180 degrees in one sweep stroke, but it's not maneuverable with the same type of body English that we get in sea kayaks. And so that was a bit of a disappointment, and it also led to an unintended consequence that increasing the hull just a tiny bit, but increasing the chine breadth a tiny bit more pushed me past the stability that I was aiming for. This particular boat is ridiculously stable, which is great if that's what you need. So in this case, the increase in stability of this gives you a perfect boat if you wanted to load this thing down with two weeks of gear and take it down a trip like the Grand Canyon where you're bombing multiple big water class three and class four rapids a day, in which case this is kind of the stability profile to be looking for. However, anytime that you make a kayak short, wider and fatter, it's gonna get a little bit slower. And something I was really hoping for is I wanted to maintain that same lightning quickness that I had in the last kayak. And so I was trying to be as careful as I could in bringing the hull volume up. And I think this would still be around as quick as the first one if I hadn't simultaneously increased the breadth of the chines down here. But even with that, I still feel like this is probably faster than any other crossover boat. It's just that after my experience with the last one, I feel like I should be able to get a little bit more quickness even at this size. So that's the first thing that I wish I would have done differently. Now, the next one is I started messing with the hull shape a little bit because in my previous version of this, before the last version, the one that was pretty darn good, but not quite there, it was similar to the overall volume of this, but there was a tiny gurgling sound at the bow. Now, is that different than really any other crossover kayak or any whitewater kayak you're ever gonna paddle? No, it's not. But it still annoys me while I'm paddling because when you're in a wilderness trip, things are nice and quiet, you wanna enjoy the scenery, you don't wanna to listen to a tiny little gurgle constantly at the front of your bow. And so the last one of these that I made it ended up being quiet, which totally surprised me because you wouldn't think that a boat with that blunt of an edge end could create that quiet of a bow, but it happened and I was hoping to keep it in this boat. And so as I brought the volume of this boat up, I started getting paranoid that as I got higher up in the water, we were gonna start pushing water a little more and we were gonna start creating that gurgle again. And so what I decided to do to try to counteract that a little bit is I put just the tiniest V shape in the front of the hull. Not much, just a tiny little V up here. And the idea behind that was that it would part the water a little more gently and I would still have a quiet bow. Now, getting this thing out on the water, turns out that is completely not the case. If I put this on the water without any gear in it and I paddle it, we're right back to that same tiny little annoying gurgling sound. But if I load it down with gear and I put it on the water, the gurgle goes away. So what that tells me is that the gurgle in the bow is not a function of shape, it's a function of volume, which means that I could have kept that nice, soft, rounded bow up there and not paid a performance penalty. Now, unfortunately, because I went for that tiny little V up there, it bites the water a little bit more than it would have otherwise at the front. And that combined with the extra two and a half inches of length at the front here means that when I'm paddling this thing loaded with gear at full speed, it pulls offline just a little bit more than I wanted. Now, not a lot more, but just a little bit more. And the most important thing about this particular boat is that it ends up tracking nice and straight while you're paddling on the flat water because 
The thing that drives you crazy in taking a sea kayak down moving water rivers is that the eddies are constantly pulling you offline. But the other thing that drives you crazy if you're doing a river kayak is that the way that those hulls work means that you're constantly expending energy to keep the boat going straight. And so my hope for this particular kayak was that I could tease some shaping into the hull that would still allow me to spin this thing 180 degrees in a whitewater situation if I needed to but would track nice and straight on the flats. So when I go ahead and build this boat again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep the same overall width, the same overall length, the same overall hull volume, but I'm gonna get rid of those hard chines on the bottom here. I'm gonna round out the front of this, but I think there's one last thing that I need to do to get this thing working the way I want it to. And that is I need to go to the stern of this boat and very carefully remove some volume toward the end. And this is something you have to be super careful with because if you just start pulling volume out of one end of the kayak, what happens? The boat sits down on the back of the boat, it pops up in the front, and now you're doing a wheelie and you're basically just a snow plow for the water, which does not lend itself to a very efficient or very fast hull shape. And so what I'm gonna try to do when I get back to this boat is just switch the hull shaping around and I think what that's gonna let me do is, once this thing gets up to speed, the tail's gonna drop in a little bit, it's gonna track a little bit harder, and if we're lucky, we're gonna get right to that sweet spot between a boat that'll spin on a dime, but it'll also track nice and straight when you're paddling it in a straight line. So that's what's going on with the hull shaping of this boat, but it's important to keep in mind that the hull is just one portion of the overall usability of the kayak. The deck lines, the cockpit outfitting, how the gear stores in the ends, all of these things contribute to your overall experience on the water. And so one of the things that I was pretty unhappy with on my last boat was I was experimenting with some changes in my deck line rigging. I was taking off some of my leather lines, I was adding some bungees, and without going into a bunch of detail, basically I just made a deck line arrangement that completely sucked. But I knew that I was onto something. And so in this one, I brought back some of my leather deck lines with toggles. And the reason I like these is because they are a lot more positive than a bungee cord. You can put a Greenland paddle under them at an angle and it works perfectly as a stabilizer. And also you can tow, rescue, or carry by any of these lines on my kayak, which is super important to me. But I had a feeling there was something to this bungee that I wanted to add to this boat. And so what I did was I removed my second leather deck line in this area. I put both the toggles on this one. I spread the line spacing a little bit wider and I added a continuous bungee across the boat right here. And the combination of these two things just works killer for being able to store a fully assembled European style paddle on the front deck. So say you're on a long wilderness trip where you're mostly gonna wanna paddle with a Greenland paddle because it's easier on your shoulders, it's just more enjoyable, it's a better kayaking tool. But when you get into the serious water, you wanna switch over to your white water paddle, but you need somewhere to put that in the meantime. And this particular setup works great for stowing a single piece or a break apart standard European paddle on the front deck. And I like it so much that I actually did an update the minute that I finished this boat to change all of my sea kayaks over to this particular arrangement. And then I went ahead and put that in my video courses. Now, another thing I did on this boat was I put the raised back deck on it. And this isn't something I do very often because quite frankly, it's kind of a pain in the butt. It adds about five hours to the overall build time and the combing is hard to build as well. And what this does is it lets you fill your stern gear bag and slide it all the way into the stern without having to load it through the cockpit. Because one of the things that's kind of annoying about camping with skin boats is oftentimes you have to load your gear in difficult ways. And for the bow of all of my sea kayaks, including this kayak right here, I always build it around the bag itself. So it's really easy to pull your bag in and push it out. But in the stern, I usually end up loading through the cockpit because you can do it there and also because it's just easier to build a flat back deck. So in this one, I put the curved back deck on it. Looks kind of cool. It's kind of a pain to build. Added about another pound to the overall construction of the boat. And when I was done, I came to the same conclusion that I always come to with this, which is I don't really want that on my own kayaks unless I'm gonna be out camping for two or three weeks at a time because I just like the overall look and the functionality of a flat back deck. I like saving a pound of weight and I like a build that takes five hours less time. 
So other changes with this boat, I used a slightly stronger wood along the bottom of the boat here because I just wanted to protect it a little bit more from hard impacts. And that raised the weight of the boat a little bit, but not too much because I left most of the framing on the top still in red cedar. And then of course, as always, my ribs here are white oak. Now for the skin on this, I did the same thing that I did last time, which was I went with my standard nine ounce skin and five coats of two-part polyurethane. And I think that's a really good durability compromise for a boat that's gonna be strong enough to handle the occasional really serious impact with a rock or the occasional abrasion, but is still gonna keep the boat relatively lightweight. Now, because this boat is framed a little bit heavier because it's meant for whitewater use, it ends up weighing a little bit more than my sea kayaks. So my F1 kayak, which is roughly this size, ends up weighing about 30 pounds. This boat, as it's framed right now, ends up weighing about 33 and a half. Although if I hadn't done what I'd done with the back deck, it would probably weigh 32 and a half, which is just fine with me. Now, if you wanted to really abuse the heck out of this, you could put a 12 ounce skin on one of these and you can pretty much ensure that no matter what you hit on the water, there's absolutely no chance that you're gonna puncture it. But to be quite honest, puncturing a skin boat is extremely rare. And I've seen this skin with this particular type of a hull layup survive things that you would swear it could not possibly survive. And so for the type of paddling that I like to do where I'm running big water rivers in the early spring and there aren't a lot of rocks exposed in the first place, I feel pretty comfortable with this. And if I did ever get a hole in it, it would be pretty easy to repair or I could put a new skin on it. Now you could potentially even put a thicker skin on this. You can go all the way up to a 24 ounce skin. You could load it up with huge amounts of coating and you would have an indestructible boat. But at that point, I think it just makes more sense to go out and buy yourself a plastic boat for that kind of a use. So that's kind of the overall construction details of this particular boat. I think at the end of the day, I'm happy that I built this boat because the mistakes that I made on here taught me more than if I would have been successful. Because the problem is if you're accidentally successful in designing something really good, then you really can't modify it because you don't understand why it paddles the way that it does. And seeing the huge increase in stability that I got for just a small increase in width and chine breadth really taught me a lot about how I need to shape this boat to be able to size it for myself and for different size paddlers. Seeing how the bow shape interacted with the water as far as how it was pushing water or not pushing water was really important. Noticing that with the same overall rib shaping formula here, but a slight increase in size, I ended up adding slightly too much volume to the stern at the same time, lets me know that I'm gonna have to modify that rib shaping formula in the stern of the boat. Overall, pretty good build. I wish I would have had the perfect boat on this one because it's always nice to get a design out there and to get people building them. And of course, I like to sell boat plans. But the reason that I have the reputation that I do here is because people know that I am obsessed with performance and quality and I'm never going to put out a design until I 100% think that it's perfect. So I think where we're going to go from here is I'm going to have to hit the pause button on this particular design for a while because I've got a bunch of other things to do here at Cape Falcon. I've got to dive into doing some updates to my canoe building course, building a triple nesting set of canoes that I'm really excited to release here. Um, I'm going to do a bunch of updates to my regular skin on frame kayak building courses, really kind of increase the overall video quality of all that stuff, and then add a bunch of new stuff to those courses as well. And if I can get through all of that by the end of the summer here, I'm really going to try to return to this and build what I think is going to be the final version of this, because I think it'd be really cool to get this out there and get people trying them. Last thing I want to say here is that this design is really starting to grow on me in a way that I didn't expect. At first, I was just envisioning this as a long distance wilderness moving whitewater slash swift water boat. But oftentimes when I'm testing these things, I can't get out in those conditions. So I'm just around here in the local quiet waterways. And I've really been enjoying just playing with this in the swamps and on the flat water. I mean, I think if you're doing any kind of serious sea kayaking, you still want to be in a sea kayak because I think the maneuverability of this, which is so enjoyable, is probably going to be offset by the fact that it's not going to hold a line unless you're actively paddling it. But just as kind of an alternative kayak shape, something that really doesn't feel anything like any other type of long kayak, it's really just kind of an interesting throwback. It's a totally different paddling experience on the water. And the more time that I spend with it on the quiet water, the more it just kind of makes me smile to be in, even though it's not necessarily the most practical boat for those uses. So really interesting boat. 
really like building it. Wish it was the one. It wasn't, but we move forward from here. All right, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. You can also check me out on my website, which is capefalconkayaks.com, where I've got a bunch more skin on frame building videos and various skin on frame resources. You can find us on our Instagram page, which is at Cape Falcon Builds, where I post a daily build blog of everything I'm doing here in the workshop, including time lapse videos. Okay, that's it for now. Have fun building your skin boat. Be safe on the water. I'll see you next time.